Hello and welcome back to the Digital Marketing Podcast. My name is Kieran Rogers. I'm Louise Crossley. And I'm Daniel Rolls. And today we are discussing the problem with digital marketing. This one's going to be a bit of a therapy. <laughs> okay, so this, this comes from, I read this article and it, we'll put it in the show notes, but it really... I thought, oh, good, someone else is thinking this well. And it was all about the kind of grift culture within digital marketing. So I'll give you an example. Just explain grift culture. Yeah, so a grifter was, used to be someone that would go from town to town kind of ripping right. people off. Uh, and the whole thing was, where this comes from, you know, you'll see, uh, I, Twitter seems to be the place where I get a lot of this stuff, where you get a thing saying, this is how I've made $10 million through applying this set of principles of how I got my YouTube to do X, Y, Z, right? Interruptive YouTube ads as well. Yeah, oh, a lot everywhere. Of it. And, it's, and then it YouTube. kind of, what happens is people go, oh, that's, that's interesting. They've got a particular take on it. And then they go and pay for their course, whatever the course is, yeah. right? And enough people do it and they do make $10 million out of it or whatever it is by selling these courses. But it becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then everyone tries to follow that tactic. And then you end up with everyone doing this stuff in a way that is very much manipulative, trying to do things to people rather than for them and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. as well. But because it works and because they make money, everyone else is thinking, oh, maybe I'm missing out on something. Maybe I should really kind of get into this. And so maybe I should look at that technique and all that kind of stuff. So I think it has, as marketers, our kind of challenge is we're always trying to make things work better and perform better. Mm. There's pressure on us to do that. And then you look at these outliers, we'll go, they've got 10 million followers on YouTube. Why aren't we getting that level mm -hmm. of engagement? And so on and so forth. So that that there's a problem with that because any industry where things are fast changing, you are going to have get rich quick. Right. Yeah. That's that it's always existed. And, and that starts to neglect like core principles and values. Yeah. And that's it. Well. Right. So I think that's a huge problem, but it is tantalizing because you think, well, why are they getting such success? So there's that. Then there's all this kind of stuff around trying to please the algorithms. Mm. Okay. So I watched this brilliant interview and this guy was saying, well, the thing is, why is your YouTube channel not performing? Well, Everyone's told to make niche content for niche audiences. And you're like, yeah, right content, right audience. But the algorithm wants stuff that everyone likes uh, because that's what gets them more views. That's what makes them more money because you know, they're selling advertising off the back of it. So more views mean more advertising sales. So what you need to do is generate stuff that's appealing to everyone but is in your niche. I'm like, what? How am I? And I, I kind of totally get, and they're, they're really, really smart about the whole thing. But it's that whole thing of actually you end up trying to be mainstream to get really broad appeal in order to try and boost the algorithm so your content that's really quite niche gets. And you, you end up and putting a square peg in a round hole. It's not really going to fit what happens. Then, I mean, this conversation you had, talk about the, the conversation you had. We don't need to name the platform if you don't want, mm. but about what you were told from a video point of view made the algorithm like Yeah, so this was a, a social network uh, I spoke with recently and they were trying to explain to me what good looks like in terms of video. Yep. Um, one of the rules they gave me was you need a brightly colored background that's consistent throughout the whole video. So that list would be bad because this is like multiple colors. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And it changes because we're moving so it, different so people. So you just want a plain background. Been trained to, no, a plain brightly colored background. So would white count so as this, a this brand that I was working with have black. Oh. And he was like, yeah, that's oh, really? not, I mean, you could get away with that probably, but it's not, it's not really, black isn't particularly bright. No, <laughs> it's the opposite. The opposite. The opposite. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, yeah, and that, that was just one, one of the things. I think one of the other things was it needs to have captions. Okay, we all know that. That helps because yeah, yeah. then the algorithm can know what it's about. And the final thing was it needs to be really engaging. Okay, right. That makes sense. But, but you see, there are always weaknesses within an algorithm that can then be exploited to a certain extent. I think increasingly, though, what I'm seeing is like that third thing that they brought in there, which was – it needs to be really good, like really engaging, right? Because there they're looking at the audience behavior and you can't really fake that. Yep. You know, so that's that's one thing. And actually when you start, initially I was quite shocked and horrified, but actually the more I thought about it, it kind of makes sense. You know, we talked about the Google core uh, web vitals. Yeah. Right, they're a measurement that Google, we know they're not perfect because you can have very engaging content that doesn't hit hit those uh, and that can still still do well but so having these kind of you know triple threats in a way like triple things that come together um to sort of plug the the weaknesses of the yes. algorithm so it can't be gamed too much 
is the thing. But it's it's kind of funny, isn't it? That, that having a brightly coloured background make is a sign of quality. <laughs> oh, I, just, I literally Not always. just nearly yeah. fucked my stall when you said yeah, that. Yeah, but I guess when you think about it, and I'm thinking about it a bit now, because actually I'm hearing well, myself say this, it's making sense. It's, it's right? been produced. You know, it's not someone just filming something on their phone. It's someone yeah. going through and actually they've edited it and produced it. But take those three things. Like yeah. it's got captions. We know exactly what it's about. The algorithm but also, like and it's and, what will stop the scroll as well. And, and it's a bright colour so that will help stop the scroll. And the final thing, because this is like a honey trinity, if you like, is it's really engaged the audience. Okay, that, now suddenly that's a little bit more well-rounded and that's harm, harder to get. It is, but I, what we got... We always need to think back. These algorithms have been built to make money, right? So the idea of the algorithms is essentially make it so that we can sell advertising. That is the motive behind all of this stuff at the end of the day. Therefore, you know, big reach, engagement, like they're going to reward all that kind of stuff as well. Mm. But that leads to sensationalism, mm. right? So, you know, if you do shocking stuff, you know, the whole, I can't bear it, the whole YouTube point, wacky faces pointing stuff. <gasps> <laughs> shock thing it just drives me absolutely bonkers so which is fine yeah if you're mr beast it's fine that stuff works right that is like shocking funny it's part of your brand stuff mm. yeah. but it's not you see like b2b brands doing it just to kind of try and play the algorithm a little bit it just it doesn't work and i think you only have to look at online advertising and say what happened to news well news worked out it can only make money one of two ways one is the paywall yeah so you exclude most of your audience but if people into pay you have to really focus on quality that's great uh or it's ads and it's shown me as much sensationalist stuff as possible so I can put as many ads in this as possible. Uh, and you've got the kind of Daily Mail end of things where it's just like sidebar of shame, get me to look at loads of pages, really, really long coat. So again, you know, we've we've been incentivized to do things a certain way by the monetization models that we've got. So I think that's challenging. We need micropayments. I've been saying this for ages, but if you had micropayments and I can pay a penny or five pence to read an article, that would kind of shift things um, as well. Um, it does result in a complete lack of control, doesn't it? Well, this like, lack it, of control is It does feel thing, like yeah. the tide has turned against quality, high quality marketing in some regard because the hacks that are known to help you reach a mass market, that they're, they're literally dumbing it down. Yeah. Like, look at that, that whole kind of YouTube <laughs> yeah, yeah. shock thing. Dumbs it right down. Doesn't matter how yeah. how good and God, you know, God forbid, you know, serious organizations start doing that. It's like, it's well, you see it all the time where people are trying around. to trying to utilize this stuff like doing something on social media they think is funny or is going to get like a reaction and it's actually pretty off brand i mean i'm being quite negative for me because i tend to try and be really positive but i think that, <laughs> that there's the worse this is the more you should ignore it right so what i mean by that is that and this is kind of to the point of 10x content that kind of stuff yeah. how can we do something that's actually exceptional what a little thing little game i've now play is when i'm on social media myself mm. When I stop scrolling, I look at something, I go, why did I just do that? Mm. What, why did I stop scrolling? Mm. And then I look at the staff and go, 80%, oh, that was quite sensationalist, it grabbed my attention. Yeah. But then you go, okay, but why did, why did this appear to be better quality than the other stuff I've looked at? And I think, you know, writing that headline, getting that image right, creating something that's truly valuable, that's where we should be focusing. We should be really crafting and honing in on that and actually saying, do less, but do it better. And I know we've said this a lot, but it, it couldn't be more true. And doing it is a lot harder than saying it. So I think that's that's where we kind of need to be with it. Now, you have got a lack of control because the platforms can change anything at any point. And you're suddenly like, oh, like, in like Google rankings, you're rel reliant on certain search terms and then suddenly you disappear from those. If they bring in, you know, the generative search that we were talking about in the previous episode where there's loads of AI results within there, what does that mean for us? So whereas if you just focus on being the best stuff on that topic, then it means you've got a better chance of kind of getting that engagement, I guess, as well. Um, but what it's meant is a lot of cases we're paying for reach. So, you know, oh, just not the algorithm's not really favoring us. We better pay for some advertising. Well, that's a game as well, right? Because they're toning down your organic reach so that you do need to pay for mm -hmm. advertising. Otherwise, you won't, you won't need to spend any money with them. So I kind of understand the profit motive kind of behind that as well. But also, so if you, you have to pay for the reach, you're losing control. The algorithms are kind of favoured against you. There's a negative culture within digital marketing. You're kind of constantly taking advantage. It can feel a little bit kind of depressing and a little bit of an uphill struggle to get all this stuff working unless you really focus on the craft. And I think that craft of generating beautiful content, that's, that's where we should be focusing our efforts. And if you go back, I always think, go back to advertising of the 1950s and 60s and think, what do people do? 
they came up with like a one liner and an image that was just like, wow, that's so clever or so playful or so interesting or something else as well. We need to get back to that. We need to go back to the kind of Mad Men era of kind of, of thinking about our campaigns and thinking about how can we do something that really resonates. But what those guys were doing was they were hacking the human algorithm rather yeah. than the digital one. And this is by my point for a long while now right. that digital algorithms are all designed to try and hack the human algorithm right. anyway. So do cool stuff that people love. Yeah, right. Is... And it's not low, lowest common denominator. No, Don't be shocking stuff or sensationalist no. stuff, but do something that's yeah. actually... It true, doesn't have to be craft. Click, clickbaity. And do, you, do you know what? Clickbait could be a terrible, it could be a disaster for a marketing campaign mm. because no one wants clicks. What we want are qualified leads or sales Versions, conversions. Yeah, right. um, so, you know, a lot of these things, you sort of reap what you sow. But I think it's definitely it's, it's an opportunity now. There's a lot of noises being dialed down on the whole magic button, press it and gives you results. Yeah. Like the, the marketplace has become quite fragmented. Um, you know, lots of organizations pushing for like first party cookies and not so much yep. reliance on third party um, cookies. And then we can all see the writing on the wall for those. And I think we are coming into an era where some of the more traditional marketing skills are hugely valuable because they solve the, these problems. So on that point, this, mm -hmm. I think we're moving into a new era of, of marketing, which is we went through the whole kind of mass media thing in the old days, right? And so, you know, Coca-Cola, advertising everywhere, X number of, of views of the brand and you become brand familiar. And then we went into this digital area where everything was about personalization, but it was all about social media and it was about reach across. And it was kind of mass media really, but in social media, that's fragmented. And the idea that we don't watch the same TV channels, we don't look at the same websites, we don't read the same social platforms even, you know, am I on X, am I on um, you know, any number of different kind of platforms that are changing and, and morphing and becoming different things to different people. So actually that whole thing of nurturing relationships, of going through and crafting content that's right for my audience, of doing something truly clever that resonates, of building a community, that community piece comes back in again, becomes really, really important. Now that's that's hard if you've got a mass consumer brand, like launching a Coca-Cola today, well, it was hard then, but I mean, it would be incredibly difficult now. But actually, the reality is that most of us aren't trying to do that. You know, we're looking at a particular market, a particular geographic region, a particular group of people, and actually focusing on that and just doing it kind of one at a time. And one of the things that I read that was really helpful to me was you kind of get frustrated because you're trying to build your numbers up. We want more subscribers to target internet. We want more leads coming in the door. And it, and it was this kind of one subscriber, one lead at a time. Right, if we can just go out, do something to get one more person in, that's all we've got to keep doing. And we've just got to keep repeating that and building it up. And actually that approach felt less overwhelming. And I think one of the problems is that marketing can be a very overwhelming job in that there's so much change and so much going on. Um, Abby Dixon, who's a, a friend of mine, um, wrote a great book uh, about this, about, you know, the whole marketer. How can you be, you know, someone that's, that's kind of enjoying what they do and is happy and has a good balance and all those kind of things as well. And I think that's important because constant change seeing other people doing stuff and succeeding and then you're not getting quite that level of success and I can't do everything all at once and I've got too many, it can be quite challenging. Mm. And the thing, accepting that and going, actually, it's not about that. I'm trying to craft something beautiful. And if you focus on that, I think that helps. And you said it before in some previous episodes, it's just about stripping it back. Yeah, and I think it's kind of easiest not to do that. And even measurement frameworks can help with this. So if you do something like OKRs, so objectives and key results, you take a step back and go, what are we actually trying to do? Mm. Why, why am I worrying about, you know, let's, let's stop getting so granular and let's just take a little step back sometimes. For us, what actually has really worked is when we've done, we do like these kind of six monthly team brainstorms where we kind of get together and go, what's gone well, what's gone badly, what are we going to do next? And it's like, okay, that kind of helps mm. me as well, I think, from that point of view. So I think the worse things get, the problem with digital marketing, the better it might get. We might come into this new era where we're actually focusing on community and all that kind of becomes really just important. just got to stop thinking about digital marketing. Right, yeah, that's not a bad channel either. You no, know, and it is such a fake construct. Mm. And I know that's rich coming from, you know, the, digital marketing, the digital marketing podcast, but it's, it's, it's true. It's not really a tangible thing. Like in our customers' minds, they don't have that distinction. No. And I think also we need to stop telling ourselves that digital is cheap. It is not. It hasn't been for some time. You know, like also, it, it, when everybody 
all moves into the same bazaar and all screaming at the top of the lungs, yeah. the price goes way high and it becomes less effective. So, you know, I think there's some real smart moves being made by some big players where they're turning to traditional like direct mail campaigns to see what they can do. You know, when you start to take your budgets and work out cost per lead, cost per conversion, you know, how does a direct mail campaign stack up? You know, and we can be so much more sophisticated with the way that we do these now because we've got really in-depth data on our customers and what they're into. Actually, in a way, you can be your own social algorithm within your own CRM yeah, right. program and you can you can market and you, and you market to people that you know and, and therefore you can predict the outcomes with a lot more success rather than these random huge audiences where you get a ton of exposure but no one cares. Yeah, right. You know, increasing us in that. And we've got on that, we've got a really great interview coming up on the podcast. Listen out for it. It's going to be coming out towards the end of the summer, um, specifically on uh, one organization in America that I've really focused on. Like, how can we take direct mail and digitize it? Use all the digital smarts, digital audiences, and digitize it. And like that interview blew my mind. Um, so watch out for that. It's a really good one. It's yeah, I coming. think there's that thing. If everyone's doing the same thing, doing something different can make mm. a huge difference as well. I, I also am quite excited, actually, about this whole piece of non-digital integrated with digital. Mm. So merchandise stuff, um, physical events, face-to-face yeah. -face meetups, all that kind of stuff to kind of bring those things together. Because that's been thrown out with the baby and the bathwater yeah, in a lot of absolutely. instances, isn't it? It's like, oh, well, let's stop doing the trade show. Are you mad? Like... Hot leads, build walking past it, build those relationships, do something different, get get attention, build a relationship, build build like warmth and understanding between others and, and what you do. That's what marketing's always been about. That's it. So, so the problem with digital marketing is hopefully going to be solved by this new era of marketing that yeah. we are ushering in. And as our listeners, it is your job to do that yes. and usher in that new era. No pressure. So we'd, we'd, yeah, we'd, <laughs> we'd love to hear your opinions on this. Uh, do you think, you know, that their digital marketing is fine. Do you think that there's some things to be solved that you feel in the same way that we do? Uh, and what original things are you doing to try and cut through all this kind of noise as well? I'd, I'd love that. I'd love for you listeners to get in touch with their cut through stories. Yeah, like, targetinternet.com, forward slash really podcast, good. all the contact details are in there, all the show notes, all that kind of stuff. Get in contact, let us know, uh, and we will feature the stuff on the podcast. As ever, thank you for listening to the Digital Marketing Podcast. Please subscribe for more videos like this and visit targetinternet.com for more free digital marketing resources.